This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast this week is Chris Schooley of Troubadour Maltings here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks, Jamie. You are the first maltster that we've had on the podcast. I love being the first. <laughs> love getting in first. So, uh, and, and I'm, but I'm excited about this because we talked to a lot of brewers about how they brew here on the podcast, uh, but we've never talked to a maltster about uh, that process of malt, that differentiation in malt, that entire process of malt from, uh, you know, from field uh, to uh, maltster to, uh, to brewer and the kinds of impacts that the decisions that maltsters make and that growers make, that uh, terroir makes, that weather makes and how those things impact, uh, you know, what people taste in the glass. We've never really dove into that subject in that kind of depth so yeah no i'm excited to get to be get to be the person to start you know start that conversation you know because i think that's probably the biggest the biggest part of all of this is you know you're not necessarily the first person who hasn't dug into that or dove sure. into that you know sure. there's a lot of brewers who haven't really dove into that so well, it's, we're we're gonna enjoy yeah peeling yeah. back some of the layers here and uh and digging right in but before we do as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, g and Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and dedication to their customers' craft. g and is committed to cold, whether you operate a brew pub or large-scale production brewery. Contact g and Chillers today at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Mention this podcast and receive up to $1,000 worth of glycol with the purchase of any new g and Chiller. Also, Tavor transports you to craft brewery bar stools all over the country. They obliterate the geographical divide that prevents you from walking directly through the doors of any brew pub. Don't just read about life, drink it. Download the free Tavor app to get sought after independent craft beer delivered right to your door. Use code BREWING for $10 in cold, hard beer money. I, I recently got my Tavor uh, app back up and running and uh, now get notifications every time there's new beer on there. And uh, it's been an interesting one to see just how... Uh, the the way the beer is bought and sold in this country is, yeah. is changing through kind of technology like that. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, and I love any ad copy with the word "obliterate" in it. That's just obliterate. fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> so so Schooly, uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, uh, how you got to this position, opening up a craft maltster here in Colorado. Uh, what led you to the point where you did this, and uh, and give me a little bit of background about how you got here. Yeah, well, I mean, really. I've always been a connections kind of person, was always interested in where things came from, you know, um, the making of things. You know, my, some of my earliest, most fondest memories are like the crayon factory at on Sesame Street, you know, or even the sugar beet farming or something on Mr. Rogers. And I always had a strong connection to that kind of thing. And uh, just kind of coming up, working odd jobs, uh, doing music or just being a general bum, uh, as a That's young true. Adult. It should be noted you are a pretty <laughs> badass DJ uh, through all of this. I'll accept that, yes. Um, but yeah, I you know I fell into specialty coffee, right. or, or um, you know a little over twenty years ago, uh, probably a little more over twenty years ago than I wish to admit at this point. But um, and you know my natural inclin- inclinations to trying to understand where those things came from uh, were perfectly fed by that industry. Uh, I. You know, after working a number of years just behind the bar as a barista and shift lead and whatnot, I was lucky enough to work for a company that was roasting their own coffee. And just immediately that clicked with me in terms of, oh, well, you know, yeah, we brew the coffee and we serve it, but it comes from this stage first. And then getting involved in the roasting led me to back through the importing and then uh, all the way back to the producers. I was getting into specialty coffee right at a time when uh, there was a massive reinvestment in the supply chain uh, in terms of really, you know, facing some uh, pricing challenges uh, along the commodity market for coffee and and recognizing that farmers, you know, couldn't afford to actually grow the coffee. Uh, but at the same time, understanding um, all the opportunity for uh 
under you know better understanding all the quality impacts throughout that supply chain and right. who's doing what throughout that so got got really heavily involved in that through the companies i was roasting for and, and um uh, buying green coffee for then got involved more in the uh green coffee side of things as well as um doing a lot of uh contract work for the for a trade association especially coffee association doing a lot of um community development kind of things as well as sensory experience design, you know, creating all the coffee services for TED Talks and things like that. Um, and and throughout all of that, you know, always wanting to look beyond that because that's one of the big things in craft, right, is we always kind of huddle up into our little circle and we start finding out we're having all the same conversations because we all have sure. the same opinions and experience. And, uh, you know, we knew that at the same time, craft beer was really exploding, and we were doing a ton of collaborating with them, if you can call just drinking a lot of craft beer collaborating. <laughs> <clears throat> but a lot of events, you Here's know. Here's the coffee. Put this in your right. uh, in your tank. Exactly. And we'll take some of that, and that's an even trade. Great. All right. Um, but, yeah, we, you know, just doing a lot of work with brewers and then, you know, realizing, hey, this is an agricultural product. You know, right. I had family that grew barley for cores growing up. Um, so I knew that that was something that happened here in the state of Colorado, uh, and started asking brewers, you know, what are your relationship look like with, with your farmers? Um, and where is this coming from as well as understanding, Hey, to get a darker beer, then somebody's roasting that barley, right. much like we're roasting coffee. I want to go talk to that person and find out, you know, how can we start kind of interacting to learn more together and then that's when I kind of realized that, oh, there's like two companies in North America who have the capabilities to even roast. So with so many craft breweries opening and growing, it seemed like there was a really good opportunity there, not just for creating specialization um, through knowing what I knew through coffee roasting, but also creating specialization through, you know, creating transparency in that supply chain and getting, you know, lo local farms tied in with local brewers and and starting that conversation, you know, not just to add, <clears throat> not just to create some, you know, hey, this is all local kind of thing, but realizing that, hey, that's how we make something better. And that's how we make something new and, and discover innovation is everybody has to be talking together, everybody involved in this. And more and more brewers that I talked to just had no real exposure directly to a barley grower or a barley breeder or even the malt house for that matter. Sure. No, there was this time in, in beer, you know, 150, 200 years ago, where if you made beer, you malted your own grain. And that was, you know, it was generally all happening at the same place, at, you know, at the brewery or next to the brewery. And then, you know, being logistics being what they were, transportation wasn't great. So you wanted to move it once and then you did it. Um, we got away from that in the kind of, you know, industrial age when, sure, sure. Uh, you know, putting things on trains became much easier and getting, you know, growing things where they were most efficient and then getting them to another place became a thing. And, uh, you know, and so, yeah, there's there's been that kind of massive shift. And now, obviously, you know, throughout this kind of craft community, we're kind of making this move uh, back to find some of those local connections, not because they're the only thing, but because right. they are a thing that can add value to, you know, to some of these products. But there's, you know, that cultural idea that you want to kind of explore this and it wasn't happening on a very large scale at the mm -hmm. time. What you, what year, uh, you know, were, were you kicking around, started kicking around this idea? Yeah, this was probably around 2012, 2013 yeah. is when I first started talking with my now current business partner, Steve Clark. Yeah. We just kind of clicked. He was a home brewer. And one day I had the thought about a malt house and I went to pick up my daughter from his house. Uh, he was having, she was having a play date with his daughter and we were having a beer in the driveway as you know, you're supposed to do yeah. in that situation. And I was just like, Hey, you're a home brewer. Would you pay a premium if you knew X, Y, and Z about where your grains came from? And he got really excited and he pulled out a pro forma business plan that he'd been working on that same day for a malt house. So we just kind of had that kismet of having that same thought at the same time. So right around 2012, 2013, we started kind of poking around and looking at the viability of the whole thing. So that's a weird dream to have at that point. I mean, it's kind of like our dream of launching a beer magazine right, right around that same time um, in 2013. It seemed, uh, you know, a little crazy. And then, uh, you know, you looked back at it a few years later, like, well, we should have just started a brewery. And now we look at it now, we're like, well, I kind of got it in yeah, a brewery. Exactly. <laughs> well, no, and that's the whole thing. Like Steve's, Steve's take was like, well, I'd love to get into brewing, but what am I going to do that's really original right, and right. exciting? What What is there peripherally around this where I can still be creative and make something, right. um, but fill a gap that's missing? And, 
you know, that's kind of the, that was really the thing at the time, you know, we, we had the benefit of looking at some viability studies that had been done uh, by Colorado State University um, by late 90s. So, you know, we're over a decade old, right. but looking at those viability studies, they were saying, hey, if you're going to make money as a malt house, then you have to produce this much malt at a time, sell it at this price. And it was very much that commodity malting model. Right. But the thing that clicked for me in looking at that viability study was that it was exactly what specialty coffee looked like 25, 30 years ago, where everything was grown, you know, by smallholder farms. Those farmers sold it to a big silo or a big processing plant that got thrown into a big pile, you know, and graded eventually out into different quality levels and then sold as a general product. You know, this is grade A, you know, coffee, strictly high grown Colombian, you know, or whatnot. And that's what you would see on the store shelves or at the cafe, or if they even said it was Colombian, like at that time, it was mostly just blends. It was Uncle Joe's, you know, morning wake up or whatever. But now you walk into, and even like up to 10 years ago, you walk into a small cafe in the middle of, of America, you know, small town in America, and you can pick up a, a pound of coffee that says it's from this farm at this altitude and this variety and processed this way. And even the big the big players are marketing their coffee that way. So that was the thing that that viability study that we looked at didn't demonstrate. It said, hey, if you want to make money really fast, then you have to make as much of this as possible for as cheap as you can. Right. And in nowhere in that did it talk about specialization, and nowhere in there did it talk about the value of transparency in the supply chain, and nowhere in there did it talk about even creating different specialty malts. It just talked about base malt. So we knew that even though there hadn't been any study in terms of what's the interest level in all of this, there was, it, there was a model to follow that we knew could be successful if we really stuck to creating that specialization and creating that transparency. Um, but at the time, you know, also there was not necessarily um, a technical industry that was here to help a small scale maltster launch a craft malting business. Um, you know, again, trying to solve those problems right. and figuring out what a production workflow looks like at this kind of scale, uh, what kind of equipment you need in order to, you know, then, then figuring out how to commission and build that equipment yeah. for something of a scale. Like, I mean, you know, I mean, there were, there are solutions at that much larger scale that Absolutely. were not necessarily out of the box solutions for anyone trying to malt at your scale or some of the others that were launching or had recently launched that same kind of time, like river bend and a few right. of the others, they were all kind of, you know, on that upswing of craft malt, uh, exactly. you know, at that point, uh, how do you solve, how'd you solve those problems? Well, it's definitely kind of, that's one of the beauties of, you know, not reaching too far back or getting tangential about it. But at the same time, that whole idea of breaking the model of that, you know, closed circle, Uh, kind of thinking of like, what can we bring from our past experience into this new thing? Like, yeah, if I'm coming from inside out of cereal seed production, then I'm going to have these presupposed notions and suppliers of here's maybe where I can get this, or here's maybe somebody who's working on something like that. Whereas coming from the outside, you know, me with coffee, looking at the roasters um, or whatnot, but my partner, Steve, uh, he came from pharmaceutical production as a project manager taking lab tests and then a uh, project managing the development of that manufacture of those drugs um, or pharmaceuticals. And with all of that, what you're doing, right, is you're creating an environment for a specific chemical reaction to take place. And then you have to be able to change that environment for the next chemical reaction to take place. And that's how you create these things. And so most of the manufacturer of things like that is in, um, you know, developed by HVAC companies because it's a whole climate control right Mm. and uh that was really what you're doing in malting is climate control you're creating an environment for something to want to grow you know you're you're rehydrating it so that the seed it wants to grow and then you're putting it in an environment where it will continue to grow and modify to to break down the protein create access to the sugars and then you need to dry it down and then in the drying it down you can engage in these you know different sugar reactions to develop uh, you know, create Maillard reactions and low-level caramelization reactions to create, um, you know, body flavor, uh, color, and um, uh, mouthfeel and things like that. So it was really um, <clears throat> taking that experience of um, 
we got to sit down with these HVAC guys who are used to building student housing and whatnot. And they were like, <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, this yeah. is fun. I, we get to make something fun. And it was crazy sitting down with an engineer and he opened up a textbook that, and it was like, oh, you need to move air, you know, humid air through a product of X, Y, Z density. And there's a chart and on the chart was barley. And this is how much CFM you need to like push through barley. And it was like, I mean, that's the whole thing is that that stuff's there somewhere. That yeah. information does exist. You just have to, you know, get your nose dirty and get your nose in the dirt and look for those truffles, you know. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about this, uh, you know. But first, with over 200 years of combined experience in the craft beverage industry, Country Malt Group's dedicated sales and support staff understand the importance of excellent ingredients, product knowledge, and expertise in making great beer. Country Malt Group's mission is to provide the products and services you need while making the process of ordering ingredients easy. The focus is to inspire your best craft. Order online at shop.countrymalt.com. And balancing barley and hops is your expertise, and for Clarion Lubricants, food-grade lubricants is theirs. The team at Clarion knows that when it comes to making great beer, you're the expert, and when it comes to supplying food-grade lubricants backed by service-oriented professionals, they're the experts. Clarion will work with you to create an efficient lubrication program that helps protect your brewery. To speak with an expert, dial 1-855-MY-CLARION. That's 855-692-5274. Or visit clarionlubricants.com. Clarion Lubricants, the expert that experts trust. So let's um, let's back up a little bit. Uh, you know, you've got this malt house. Now. Yeah. Uh, you talked earlier about building relationships directly with the farmers, and uh, I, I am a sucker uh, for chronological uh, kind of <laughs> linear thinking through these processes. And so I think, uh, you know, a cool place for us to start this conversation really is, a, you know, in, in the field and with, uh, you know, that kind of barley grain itself. Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about building relationships with local growers. Um, and then we can talk maybe a little bit about, uh, you know, what you have found through the last few years of working directly with growers, uh, exploring some of the differences that barley varieties make, exploring some of the differences that terroir and that weather changes, you know, throughout a season, you know, might make to that, uh, you know, kind of rough product that then, uh, you know, you bring into the malt house. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it's not like you can open up the yellow pages and find, you know, here, here's a, a barley grower or somebody who's growing barley. Or for that matter, it's really hard to actually track down where do you get raw barley in the first place, right. you know? so um, Even though we're here in Colorado <clears throat> and there are fields full of barley, uh, you know, in right. various parts of the state. But only, only a, a small percentage of it is, you know, grown without um, an attached contract to it in the yeah. first place. Yeah. And, and honestly... The barley, even if, you know, one of the big guys, if Coors grow, like, uh, contracts you to grow that barley, um, even if they reject it for whatever reason, you couldn't, as a malt house, you couldn't purchase that barley and malt it because of the IP attached to that. So there was a big challenge out of the gate, just what are we going to malt in the first place? Do they send it to feed or something if, uh, if it doesn't make... Possibly. Some yeah. of it. I mean, it's re that's a really, I mean... So barley is traded on the commodities market. It's a, it's a it's a commodity. So it's traded on the C market and its price is attached to that C market. And why it's traded on the C market is because it was used for feed. Um it was a you know a common supplement within livestock feed and whatnot. Yeah. But really that practice phased out in the in the 90s, mm. mid 90s or so and and they started using a lot less barley in livestock feed production. And so most of the barley grown in the United States is grown for malting purposes. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> and to that end, you know, at the current uh, market share that craft beer has, more around 60% of all malting barley grown in the U.S. is grown for craft beer. Really? Yeah, absolutely. But that being said, I mean, just some real basic math being done there, it's kind of ridiculous that the price is still attached to this mode that right. it's no longer in use for. And quite frankly, that commodity price continues to go down while the cost of production continues to climb. And that's some really basic economics. You know, if you're not reinvesting in your supply chain, then it dries up. But in that regard, uh, so that was part of our impetus and part of our thought process in, in terms of diving into this was that, hey, we need to reinvest in that. So, uh, you know, people think about agriculture 
in this really kind of separate thing. It's We're really removed from agriculture nowadays that, oh, well, it's all these giant corporations and whatnot. Um, everything growing out there is owned by, you know, a massive, a massive in, in industrial group. But the growers are all, at least here in this area, um, are all small independent businesses, just like I'm a small independent business, just like our customers, brewers and distillers are small independent businesses. And better understanding that really opens up the door to, hey, if we can approach these folks, offer a better price, offer a stronger, more you know, intense relationship, intense in terms of like, hey, we're going to work together through this and, and try to shoulder some of the risk with this of this with you. Um, and then on top of all that, instead of throwing all of all of your efforts into a big pile and you don't really know where it ends up, you're going to know exactly where it ends up. So there is a really great opportunity there to add value on both ends of the supply chain. You know, and that's really it as a somebody working in the middle of all of that. This is all, you know, value added agriculture at every step you're doing something to make it more usable, to right. make it more precious. Um, I mean, hopefully that's what it's you're still, doing. You know, it's still a big risk for a, for a local grower that's, you know, got you know, maybe decades or a century of, of family experience growing uh, certain crops on their land right here to say, hey, I'm going to give up this sure thing that I've been doing for the last 20 years and, and then jump in with a, a small time right. startup, uh, uh, you know, uh, malt house, uh, to make this other thing like, you know, yes, you might make uh, two, two or three times as much, uh, per pound for the barley that you grow. But the but, acreage is going to be a lot lower. The right, volume's a right, lot lower, but right. you know, and along those lines, like sure things in agriculture don't actually <laughs> <laughs> exist. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. Uh, ever, after every season that we've, you know, done this and, and grown with folks, you know, and faced whatever challenge we faced that season, they're always like, well, we'll never see that. It's good we figured that out because we'll never see that again. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> that's a it's an interesting point. And that kind of variability is, is uh, you know, something that, you know, again, that old mode of mass large scale beer production has kind of glossed over, you know, filling right. out, um, creating a kind of, you know, monocultural, always consistent kind of product out there. Um, and that is the kind of thing that craft beer kind of came along to upset to some degree and sure. kind of reset that connection and understanding that uh, some of these things may change from year to year as the hops change, as the barley crops change. Um, but talk to me a little bit about, from your perspective, what you have seen through that process over the last few years of working with local growers in terms of, uh, you know, what what is that kind of range of difference, you know, from year to year in some of the barley? And what do you, uh, you know, what kind of effect does that then have? Yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you directly, we're working predominantly on the barley end of things with uh, uh, Genie is the barley variety. It's a yeah. Lima grain variety. Um, we were actually the first um, group to contract it for commercial purposes. There was some seed expansion done in Idaho, um, and they were definitely active in in shopping that grain around, but nobody had really taken that risk to dive in to, to contract it and see what it would do. And we were the first to do that that first big push. And, and so when you say this, there, this is, you know, uh, Lima, right? Or, mm -hmm. Lima uh, grain. Lima grain. So, you know, which is actually, they, they are here in Northern Colorado also, and they are a company that from an agricultural perspective, develops and you know creates uh, you know uh, seed varieties that they then market out to farmers. Yep. So Lima Grain is actually the fourth largest uh, cereal seed breeder in the world. Okay. Um which they came, you know, to our door just through happenstance because right at the same time that we were looking to open a malt house, they were in North America they pr predominantly do wheat uh, varieties. Um but their their uh, director at the time was a big craft beer fan and was like, hey, I know that there's these barley varieties that we have in the UK and mainland Europe that can that would do really well here in the United States, um, and I'd love to see that happen. And there and also seeing that there's an opportunity in that supply chain in the U.S. to introduce some newer varieties. So, we, I mean. We had the full disposal of the fourth largest cereal seed breeder in the world at sure, our door, a sure. two-person startup, um, which, you know, at first we were kind of intimidated and scared by because we're reasonable human beings. Right. Um, 
But as it turns out, you know, Lima Grain is actually a, a farmer owned cooperative based corporate structure. Um, you know, we obviously did our research into looking into their background and what they were all about. And all of their breeding programs, you know, work really closely with universities and it's uh, public domain varieties. You know, they're not creating IP that then they sell to the highest bidder who then, you know, takes them off the market for anybody else. So we were working with a, a partner in that degree that was really kind of open minded and trying to create new opportunities for people. Um, but as it would turn out, as luck would turn out, that genie loved Colorado and, you know, yields were fantastic. Proteins were right in the pocket where you want them, you know, under, under 11%, um, over 9%. The test weights were really good. Um, that it's actual density, you know, and it's plumpness. Uh, so it just fell right into that spec that we knew would work really well. And again, like going back to, you know, serving both ends of that supply chain, the fact that it was so agronomically sound and was high yielding with low water usage and low, uh, low input meant that, hey, this was a win on both ends of things. And what it did in the malt house was incredible. You know, it just really, um, really loved to germinate and had great um, uh, potential in terms of its extract and sugars and whatnot, but really gave us a lot to play around with in terms of flavor development and whatnot. Um, but then, you know, the next year, the next crop that we planted, uh, we had some, uh, diff- you know, the first year we had like billion dollar rainstorms <laughs> where everything like came in in May, right, you know, right. right after everything sprouted and rained up through early July while everything was growing. And then when everything needed to dry up, it just stopped raining and it was perfect. Um, and then the next year we got decent amount of rain coverage, but it all happened a lot later in the season. Um, and it changed the stress on the plant a little bit and it drove the test weight and the density up on that. And so then what that did in the drove malt the house, up? it drove the, the density of it, how, oh, okay. like how much barley would fit in the same kind of volume measurement. Oh, okay. So it would weight, Yes. In terms of it, like less of it weighed more, um, but that way, the way that I, that sat in our vessels really changed the, the nature of the, you know, how it oxygenated and got rid of CO2 and how much energy it had for germination and whatnot. So we had to really adapt our processes to get the best out of that malt um, or to get the best out of that grain to make the most malt. So you did see that year to year change. But that being said, it still made these tremendous malts out of it. So that really is, it speaks to you know, what the real potential of doing small batch craft stuff is, yeah. which is, you know, most malt or most uh, malting barley varieties had been bred to fit within a very specific quality spec, because if you're going to, you know, malt half a million pounds of it at a time, you need to know that it's more or less going to do the same thing across that whole, you know, half a million pounds worth of uh, product that's that's developed that's modifying at the same time. Whereas if you're making, you know, four tons at a time, five tons at a time, then you have a lot more malleability with that with your whole process. You know, you can't change a half a million pound um, malt house on a dime right. to behave differently. You know, I'm sure there's, you can make a number of different adjustments throughout it, but we're much more able to just make adjustments to our processes to take barley that might be seen as out of spec and not worthwhile and work with it until we find where it is, where it will produce something really special and unique. And in the same time, since our spec isn't necessarily designed just to hit that narrow mark to make, you know, yellow fizzy beer or whatnot. Now, maybe something that happened to it that in the past would have been a detriment. Now we understand, oh, actually, that gives us more ability to do this in the malt house with it, play around with the temperature that it germinates at or what we do um, in the kilning or how long we hydrate it in the steeping um, to develop a, a more flavorful malt too. And that's one of the big things there is that bar- malting, uh, cereals have been bred to just make sugar, not to really create nuance and flavor. I'd like to explore that a little bit more, but first talk to me. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what makes the perfect malting barley. Um, you know, what is it, uh, you know, specifically about that, you know, um, 
you know, from the perspective of a maltster, what are those components? You know, you mentioned protein between nine and 11%. You mentioned the kind of plumpness, you know, you want some, you know, enough of there, you don't want it a, a thin kind of uh, weak kind of grain, you know, uh, I imagine there's some husk component to that in the way that it works with the grain that is probably more beneficial for malting and brewing. Um, kind of talk to me about what like that ideal of a malting kind of grain is. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the the spec is really built around, like I was saying, the process and how it's going to react to that process, as well as what's going to carry on through to the brewer. So the reason yeah. why protein is so uh, so important in that regard is a, is a higher protein um, generally passed through to the brewer is going to be a lot harder to draw out that enzymatic energy from it. So hitting that spec has a lot to do not just with how much sugar is available, but that en- how much enzyme it has there to give it the power to, to, right. to process in the, in the brew house as well. And what we do in the malt house with it. So, um, you know, like I'll speak specifically to that density. Like I was saying, is it really affect the way that it hydrated, uh, the grain in the first, the way that it drank water in the steeping process of that. Um, and what that's done is really led us to change. So higher density would mean smaller kind of barley kernels so that they were more compacted together right. generally. Okay. So traditionally, the most of the malting systems that I've seen in craft malt um, are vertical tanks, kind of like yeah. fermentation tanks and whatnot. Um, so while the steeping process is you have submersion, you know, full submersion while it's underwater, taking up that oxygen and hydrating the full kernel. Um, and then once it's reached a certain point with that, you want to drain it and let it breathe and respirate to push out CO2, make room for more oxygen. So it will get up to that growing potential, that 44% or so uh, moisture content where it wants to grow. And so a lot of that spec has to do with how well that will hydrate. Um, you know, some of those things will talk to its, it could be water sensitive in terms of it might not want to drink up. It, it, like traditionally you might want to give it a longer soak, but some of that spec might lead it to, you know, shock itself if it's underwater too much or underwater too long. So um, looking at a vertical tank, which like I was saying, a lot of the malt houses have have used, utilized for their steeping, while it's underwater, it's easy to um, aerate it and stir it up and, and agitate it. So you're, you know, so you're ex- making sure you're um, distributing the oxygen and whatnot through that process right. as well as possible. But then during that uh, respiration period, while it's all just sitting on top of itself, you've got nine feet of grain bed that's just like sitting heavy, trapping things. And, you, you know, most folks who are doing this have active CO2 removal, you know, some blowers that are pulling the CO2 out or blowing the CO2 out as it's sitting there. So you're not creating this anaerobic growth environment. Um but still, it's not ideal if you're moving that through, you know, nine feet of grain bed. So, you know, we're actually in the process of building, uh, rebuilding our, our malt houses where we're, well, we're expanding. And in that expansion, um, adding another malt house. But we're moving to a, a unisystem kind of design where instead of having a separate steeping, we're going to steep in the same vessel. And that's because that germ vessel is really built to have a shallow grain bed. And then the entirety of the grain bed is exposed to, you know, perforations. So now we have a much more shallow uh, grain be- uh, depth so that we have a den- if we have a denser crop like that, we can really control the aeration of that and make sure that none of those corners are getting compressed and developing those anaerobic activities where then it's not going to end up growing in the, down the line in the germ house. You mentioned a little bit earlier that um, you know even though you have some of these varieties and, and some of this kind of change from from crop year to crop year, that uh, rather than looking at that as ruining a crop, it could potentially create some different opportunities or allow you to do things that could be more you know allow for some interest, you know, and uh, create some some different kinds of things in the malt house. Talk to me a little bit about you know how that reflects, uh, you know, and what kind of impacts that might have. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's part of the really exciting part of what's going on in malting right now. Um, in as much as, you know, there's a number of university programs going on now that are looking at variety and the impact of all of that in a way that hasn't been done before, that most of that was privatized for a long time, um, or, uh, um, 
you know, more driven by the companies themselves who are malting as as well as the genetic end of that. Like gen, the genetic programs are kind of opening up and looking at everything like that. So right now there's there's not a ton of information out there in terms of what those impacts are and how much terroir plays a difference. There's been a couple studies done around variety and the impact of variety. And so they've taken, you know, some different uh, Canadian varieties and some different, um, you know, United States varieties and whatnot and done sensory taste tests yeah. comparing those. But the thing is, is we don't really know, like they, they'll they show us on the graph, hey, people thought this tasted in this category and this tasted in this category, but we don't know if we're tasting the variety yet because those that's that variety that was grown in Alberta and then malted at that malt house. And even if, you know, the a different variety malted in Vancouver, Washington, that's malted on a different malt house and grown in a different environment. So right, right. We, like we're at that stage right now where there's so many layers to peel back. And even to if find they're brewed in the same kind of brewery using the same yeast and the same batch of hops, like there's still different things that happen in different tanks, you know, exactly. it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, individual variables to try to tease out, uh, you know, a lot of learning from. But we know, we definitely do know that these varieties, you know, if you're you're paying attention to, now we have a couple different crops of that genie that we're growing comparatively with other malting barleys that have been grown in the state. And genie produces really well here within that, you know, spec that, that people tend to like. Um, so now we can, now with that kind of uh, data, we can now go back to the malt house and start looking at the impact of the crop year like we did with, you know, that 2015 versus 2016 crop and the way it acted in the malt house and what we got out of it and really express things in a, in a, in a, in a different way that really embraces that. And that's the really hope, you know, that's the big hope of this whole thing is that now we can produce a, you know, quote unquote Pilsner style malt that isn't necessarily, oh, it's just lightly kilned and that's what identifies it. It's that, oh, well, it's slightly kilned, so now you can taste the crop year and the variety and where it was grown and start to get that as an expression rather than, hey, this is just a sugar source that doesn't have a lot of color on it. It's now an expression of all those different things that now we're starting to peel away and, and start to better understand. One of the things that you've definitely you know been focusing on is working with the brewers in order to, you know, you know and uh, – to dial in some of the flavors of those malts, uh, either to customize them for them, you know, if they're ordering enough or to, to work on making sure that, you know, some of these specific malts help them make flavorful beers in the kinds of styles that they're trying to make it. Um, talk to me then a little bit about how you go through that process and, you know, what some of these decisions that you're making in the malt house do to say, produce more Pilsner character in a Pilsner malt, uh, you know, or Pilsner style malt since we're in right. Colorado and not in the <laughs> Czech Republic. Um, you know, talk to me about some of those decisions and those choices, you know, that you make aesthetically and, uh, you know, sensorily driven, uh, you know, in order to kind of push these, uh, these malts in different directions. Yeah. Well, um, that was one of the things that, that got us really excited right out of the gate was researching different malt styles, you know, trying to understand what do we need to make? What are the opportunities out here? What different styles are, are in heavy rotation? What are things that, you know, maybe you just use a little bit of and what direction do we want to go with that? And doing that research and digging into that, what we discovered that rather than there being these traditional styles per se, it was much more um, proprietarily driven. You know, it was much more Kleenexes and Frisbees. Like this shop tried to make, you know, a crystal style malt and their kiln didn't quite get it hot enough, to, fast enough to actually crystallize the sugars, but it still had some really cool sugar development in there. So that's a caramel style malt instead of a crystal malt or whatnot. And to us, that just really opened up the door to, oh, we get to really just play around here, you know? And so understanding what was happening in the malting process. So what process, you're saying there is that some of the things that have become styles of malt that we brew with now were started as their own happy accidents, you know, at various malt houses for various kinds right. of reasons. As much as I can say, yeah. I mean, I don't, sure, I don't sure. know firsthand, but it certainly appears that way. Um, 
But it, in it, or you know, it was that they really understood that it was the sugar modification process in this way, and so how can we try to create something along those lines? So instead of it hitting a specific style mark, it was much more about what's the you know what are we developing at this point? If we're just trying to deliver as much sugar as possible, then we don't want to convert too much of that in the malt house so that they can convert that in the brew house and get that full extraction versus, hey, we want to add some more color in here, some more depth of flavor, some more mouthfeel, um, head retention, things like that. We might play around with how we modify it, how much protein we break down, how much we leave in there, and then how we manipulate the sugar in the kilning process, playing around with moisture content and temperature to really start developing these mired reactions and, and caramelization reactions. So for us, we just kind of looked at that more as a playground, you know, in the sense of, you know, we had a, a system that we built from scratch that was all fully manual. So, you know, all of that was about collecting as much data as possible really trying to understand where in the process we can start tweaking things to start making things that were really specific and unique. So out of the gate, instead of making a base two-row pale malt, or even something that we said the word Pilsner on, or even a caramel malt or whatever, or Munich-style malt, we gave our malts really unique names because we really wanted to start that conversation of thinking about them differently, beyond thinking of them as here's the extract number and here's the color level, which isn't even really a color, it's just how opaque it is, right? So let's start really thinking about flavor and color and really diving into these in a sensory kind of way. Um, so we, you know, we started playing around with things a little bit, developed a couple things that seemed to catch on. We were able to hybridize kind of some styles, um, so that we got good extraction, but added some more character and nuance, and then bringing those to breweries and working with them through that about where they would apply that, it really opened the door to them coming to us. I mean, at first it was confusing because we're like, well, what do I do with a ballad malt? I've never used a ballad malt before, you know? But that opened the opportunity to say, you know, to have that conversation with us so that we could work on them through recipes to, to show them where it might apply in replacing this malt or that malt or even just adding it as a completely new nuance, you know. So that really created we, – we had to lay that groundwork down if that makes sense. We kind of thought that there would be a much more customization out of the gate. But, you know, we went to brewers and said, what do you want? And they were like, what do you mean? Right, right. I'm used to painting with, you know, these certain pigments and I, you know, if there's a, a, a different variety of that pigment, then hey, that's great. But I still kind of construct, you know, right. colors and shades with these basic units, you know, trying to come in with a, a different color, what, you know, entirely or, diff, you know, would just throw off some of these systems. And yet at the same time, I, I could see it being a gradual thing where, you know, that dialogue starts to occur. And then some, you know, once you've got those basics down, right. then you can start moving in some of those directions. But how do you make decisions then, you know, as to what are those, you know, because you're also a business and you need mm -hmm. to sell, a, you know, what you make, hopefully sell all that you make. Right. Um, you know, and, and so you need to have customers that are happy and can use this and are enjoying using this and can create the kinds of flavorful things that then there are, you know, there's all these layers of consumer yep. expectations. You know, if you make a beer that's supposedly a stout, then, you know, consumer has an expectation for that. The brewer has the expectation for what that general idea of style is, you know, and then that flows back to the, you know, they have a, the brewer has a general idea of the kinds of malts that they would put into that kind of thing. And so, you know, all of these layers of expectations, right. you know, move back all the way to you, you know, as, as the maltster then in that kind of scenario, trying to reinvent that from the ground up and saying, Hey, you could also do it this right. way, you know, it becomes a different kind of challenging, uh, you know, thing to put out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, a lot of it was the process of just finding those brewers in the first place who were really looking to experiment and were waiting for that opportunity. Yeah. You know, we knew that we were creating a niche within a niche within a niche within another niche, you know, like yeah. it's yeah. not something for everybody. It's not intended to be that way. Right. Um, you know, so we generally kind of decipher that in early conversations with, you know, talking to so many different brewers about where their capacity was for experimentation and, and especially within that realm. Um, so we were really lucky to work with, you know, 
folks like Zach Coleman at True, you know, really early on who just had a really, you know, awesome sense of wonder, you know, what is possible here? How can we push these things forward? Um, But a lot of it was also just that whole intentionality from the first place, rather than like, here's this malt and it does all these a billion things. It was kind of like, let's develop a malt that can do this kind of specific thing and have some, you know, some layers to it that, that it carries with it. But really we're trying to highlight either a specific flavor or a specific color in there in its own unique way. And then, you know, that next layer being rather than that being something that's added to a beer to further, you know, um, make it more complicated let's simplify these things so that things really stand so these these attributes really stand out and that's ultimately you know craft and that consumer experience about what is better if it truly is better is really driven by that noticeable tasteable difference right so if it can be 100 percent transparently sourced and local is all hell and whatnot but ultimately if it doesn't taste or do something different that they're not getting from it otherwise they're not going to keep coming back to it so ultimately that malt has to provide something that that really is unique that they're not seeing from from another another source so you know if we look at you know a lot of a number of beers uh, some of the things that we like about some of those beers are process and technical brewing approaches that are met were developed a long time ago to overcome weaknesses in the mm-hmm. malt itself, you know, things like, uh, you know, decoction brewing right. in order to, uh, you know, Im- improve the, the, you know, kind of attenuation of these beers, like ultimately leads to a little more, ca- you know, caramelization and a little more, you know, feeling of body in these, but it was not because, uh, you know, it was really to overcome again, some of the, you know, under modified malts that they were brewing with right. at the time. Like it's, um, you know, and it's funny in some sense how the things, the traits that we've grown to really enjoy about things were adjustments, at, right? Yeah. You know, some of the things that you had to do to fix some of the other problems that that kind of came up. Um, you know, so then coming at it from a blank slate and figuring out how we don't make some of those problems right. that we then have to fix in other ways means you have to, you know, in some time, some ways kind of reproduce that kind of flavor impact uh, within the raw material itself. Right. Since, you know, the technique itself is no longer necessary for that. Well, but then the technique is now manifested in a, you know, in an expectation of the style or whatnot. Yeah. Like as much as that was an adjustment at a time, now it's a, you know, now they've like with a hazy beer, for instance, right? Is now we've, you know, built this profile that's really about highlighting these um, hops and the aromatics of the hops right. um, in these fruitier kind of contexts. Um, but they've still manipulated the grist bills and all of that to, you know, they have to create that mouthfeel so it, you know, um, there's an adjustment back the other way right. at in that level. And now we're looking at that opportunity where, I mean, that's, that really kind of goes back to your earlier question in terms of how do you, you know, pass that along and, and, and through the consumer and get them all excited about it is out of the gate, most brewers, they were like, oh, well, if we want to brew with your malt, then we have to brew 100% you know, Troubadour beer so we can really market it. And that means we have to do a maltier style or whatnot. And then it's being pigeonholed rather than, no, we developed this malt to perform really well in this context. Like, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm completely over the moon when you make a 100% Troubadour beer, but we're really trying to develop tools that the brewer likes to use and apply in a multiple of different ways, you know, because that means that they're getting an, that they're getting that thing from it that they can't get from anything else. It's an impact ingredient. You don't have to make a 100% Troubadour beer to get this thing from it that's going to lend this this quality to it that you want to. And you don't have to make it a, a malt forward style per se, because like I was just saying, those hazy beers, that, that haze and the mouthfeel, that's the protein from the malt. So even though it's a hop forward style, to execute it in the right way, you have to have the right grist bill or, you know, spontaneous beers or sours, wild fermentation being bug driven beers. If you don't have the right food for those bugs, they're not going to behave in the right way. So again, it's, you know, a a yeast or bug driven style 
that is as it dependent on everything else um, to really execute it fully. So it's not one of those things where, hey, everybody, you have to pay attention to malts more than everything else now. Right, it's right. like, hey, now we have the opportunity to pay attention to all these things in a context where we're working directly with yeast propagation labs, working directly with maltsters, working directly with, you know, hop farms to find these um, attributes and flavors and experiences that we can put together in this much more informed way, um, as well as a way that leads to innovation and what, what else is, what, what's new in all that too. Let's talk a little bit about building flavor in very light malts because I do, I, I, you know, that is something that a lot, I talk to a lot of brewers about, but you were just mentioning uh, spontaneous bugs and we have a bottle of uh, primitive beer shibble shabble right. uh, that just won a silver medal. It's brewed with your malt and it's staring at us here and I feel like we should drink some while we, we talk about We should definitely drink this. some. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is one of those cases where, um, you know, again, bug, bug driven style, but the right food. So... Uh, the malts that we've, we've used a couple of different base malts, uh, with primitive, uh, predominantly our Rhapsody and our Peevich, which are both lightly kilned malts. Our Rhapsody is a malt that we actually developed originally through conversation with Zach at True and, uh, Charlie over at Gilded Goat, um, who were looking for that slightly under modified, uh, malt. Oh, beautiful. Um, looking for that slightly undermodified malt to do these spontaneous beers with so that there were longer food chains for the bugs to eat while they were sitting in the wood. Um, so that was a malt that really, you know, um, came out of those conversations. And it was the first one that really was driven by um, the brewers now saying, oh, okay, we get us now. This is what we want. This is what we're looking for. Um, and so we developed this uh, this Rhapsody um, again, you know, a lightly kiln malt so that what we're really trying to highlight is the variety of genie, um, as well as the growing conditions that year and that it's grown here in Colorado. And the other thing that, you know, um, would be, be kind of hard to, to trial. You know, we've talked to a couple of students about it at the FST program at CSU and, and Brandon from Primitive is really involved in that pro- program as well. We've put it forward to him and we've scratched our heads over it a little bit. But one of the arguments that we'll continue to make until it's disproven is that um, if you're doing spontaneous fermentation, then providing a food source to those bugs that they can recognize easily. I mean, the bugs are going to be drawn to the sugar no matter what. But if it's a sugar chain that they recognize because it's the same one that they're eating out in the field, then there might even be more active, you know, they might even be more active in that in that fermentation and happier with all of that. So that's an interesting idea, but it would seem to, you know, that that would apply to pretty much, you know, all barley, uh, you know, kind of equivalently, you know, across the board, I guess, you know, if you're making some argument that for spontaneous beer here in Colorado, that these bugs might be more attuned to that than I can kind of see yeah, where yeah, you're yeah. going there. Kind of. See. It's, a, it's a stretch. It's maybe but, a little yeah. bit of a stretch, um, you know, but, uh, you know, is are there some specifics to the malt, you know, here in terms of, you, you know, mentioned, um, you know, providing that kind of food over the long run, which is, you know, really harder to attenuate stuff that you're trying to, mm-hmm. you know, then boil the shit out of in order <laughs> to uh, also build some kind of color around it. And, you know, if you're going to kind of do it, you know, in that traditional way. Sure. Um, you know, how does that, you know, say over us, uh, you know, other barley varieties provide more of that kind of food for these bugs? Um, well, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's tied into the overall modification so that it will, you know, jumpstart and go after that, uh, initially while still leaving something there for it to work on over time. So it just doesn't burn itself out. Um, as far as like the genie variety, I don't know if you can tie it directly to the genie variety other than, um, we've seen through trials, through some of the, um, uh, uh, actual variety trials that are not necessarily sensory driven, but are more quality spec driven where genie really does sit right in that happy pocket in terms of what it, what it will develop and where it will sit, um, within the quality spec, 
Uh, so, so far, and it's, it's also been a variety that has been proven to grow really, really well in some other different climates. It's actually, the funny thing is, is that it's a fluke variety to begin with in terms of it was a variety that was developed for distilling in the UK and its protein hmm. profile didn't quite meet the, the standards for that. So it was a variety that was going to be phased out of production. And now it's something that's completely changed, you know, definitely changed craft malt, but it's definitely changing craft beer in a major way as well. So from that, how, uh, how far has Genie, LCS Genie gone as a variety of uh, barley beyond just what you're doing at Troubadour? Well, you know, there's um, most people who are growing a malting barley in Colorado now that aren't growing it for a chorus contract are grow at least some percentage of Genie. I know there's some folks introducing some other varieties. Um, it's definitely stretched outside of the state uh, throughout the region. Uh, and I know that there's larger malt houses who are showing more more active interest in, in using it in their malt houses as well. Um uh, I know that LCS or Lima Grain has introduced some other varieties throughout like the Southeast uh, where the growing conditions are different and where, um, you know, it's been predominantly like six row production, which is more protein heavy, but produces a little bit better in that region traditionally. Um, whereas now these newer varieties like Violetta, uh, which I know is, is people are working like I know the Riverbend guys are doing some of that stuff. Um, and they're really, really happy with what they're getting from that to the point that now um, AMBA, American Malting Barley Association, is, isn't is putting any further funding into any six-row development. They're only looking at two-row development from this point on. Because they last found year. some two-row varieties that right. grow well in the south and warmer climates. Exactly. Like that. Huh. Uh, it is kind of a fascinating thing to see now the kind of variety that's very geographically or can be geographically specific, um, you know, and obviously those stories are important for craft brewers yep. that uh, a lot of craft brewers are tied to place for a variety of reasons and being tied now to maltsters, you know, that are close to, or at least, you know, in, in various regions in those places uh, using barley that's also from those places builds an attractive and romantic story. Absolutely. Um, but it, I, I think the other piece that it speaks to that I find so interesting and, uh, and so valuable is that it creates also different flavor experiences Yeah, that, uh, you know, I think what we all have sought for in craft beer is beer that is not the same everywhere you go, no matter what, because you could already find that in, in beer. If you wanted to yeah, find that, right. Yeah. You, know, you can go to all the different Budweiser plants in the, you know, North America and it will taste the same at every one of those plants because they work very hard to make it taste Absolutely. the same all those places. So if I drink a hazy IPA in San Diego, I, and then drink one in, you know, Vermont or, or Massachusetts and then drink one in Florida, I do not want those beers to taste the same. No, I, you know, they shouldn't taste the same. They should, you know, they should be different. The brewers should be different. The approaches to those beers, even though they're roughly in the same kind of, you know, broad category, um, they should have some regional, uh, you know, flavor and approach that, uh, the drinkers in that area enjoy. And if that's driven by local agriculture and ingredients, mm -hmm. as well as, uh, you know, the, the kind of tastes and trends among those brewers, uh, then that's a beautiful thing. I've always enjoyed say going to, you know, say Portland or, or Seattle mm -hmm. and tasting their take on, on West coast IPAs with a little more of a dank and diesel right. approach to it, you know, versus that kind of dry and dusty San Diego style, mm -hmm. you know, which is more floral and you know, more, yeah. you know, but, but also kind of clean and does not mm -hmm. have any of that kind of, that kind of dank character to it. Um, the idea that malt, you know, can also create that same kind of variety in flavor based on geography is uh, uh, a pretty awesome and cool thing. Yeah. Well, I think number one, um, consistency really is one of those words that's been thrown in craft's face since day one, right? Saying like, Hey, that's all fine and good that you want to do your little small batch, whatever, but you're not a real brewer, you're not a real coffee roaster, or a real whatever, unless you can do the same thing a, a thousand times. 
And, you know, I don't, I, by no stretch of the imagination, do I devalue that, that that takes a high level of skill, but that's also not necessarily what we're trying to achieve in craft from the beginning. (laughs) From the beginning, it was supposed to be something that was really different, something that was a personal expression. And, you know, the number one slag against uh, small maltsters since day one is the same one that was the number one slag against all the craft brewers from day one, which is, oh, well, they're not very consistent. That's like, well, you know, consistency is a really funny thing in general. Like consistency, I want to deliver a consistent quality that my customers, you know, know what to predict that it's, they're going to get, you know, this parameter and it's going to work the way that they want it to work. But I'm also trying to make it better every time I make it, you know, and and consistency also is the enemy of innovation and, and something new because you're stuck doing the same thing over and over again. And now we're seeing that trend across craft beer with even the largest brands are putting out new products every other week, you know, they're right. and they're right. and, and core brands are flagships are are, you know, plateauing at best. So, I mean, there's a and whole that, thing about right, like, right. hey, mm-hmm. now we have, now you have this opportunity to change things up in this other way, you know, where you can, you know, these new things that you want to do, this pressure to create something new can be driven by all of your raw materials. But I think it's really important, like, yes, there's romance to the terroir and the taste of place, where it comes from and the, the variety, and we want to embrace all of that, but... Malt is a dynamic, exciting thing that, yes, all those things are important, but it's all just latent potential. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not intrinsic. It's not just there. Somebody has to unlock that. And that's why we exist. You know, that's why we're important is because we're going to take all that latent potential from the terroir, from the season, from the variety and play around with that to create something new. You know, that was the thing that always drove me crazy about chefs or roasters or brewers when they would say oh i'm not really doing anything special i'm just trying to stay out of the way of the ingredients and it's like well if you're not doing anything special to it then why are you charging me three times what you paid for the raw materials you know like you got to embrace that this is val- like i was saying earlier this is value added agriculture this is a value add supply chain you're making it more special and more precious by c- creating new combinations and new um uh, <laughs> new activities and, and, and whatnot. So you have to really embrace that. I mean, that's the piece of this that I'm, I want people to get excited about local. I want people to get excited about variety, but I want them to get excited that that means that you have a local craftsperson that you can work closely with to develop something out of that. That's, that's brand new. Like that's, it doesn't end at just the latent potential of the raw material. So what, uh, with the brewers that you work with, what does that innovation process look like? You know, what is, you know, does it, I I assume it starts with tasting some malts and then, and trying to get an understanding of how they work and, uh, you know, and how these varying combinations can kind of, uh, you know, produce different things. But tell me a little bit about that innovation process and maybe we'll taste a little bit of your malt here while we do it too. Because I'd love to. So, um, a lot of that, like I said, was looking at what existed on the market already and what people were using a lot of and where we can fill some of those gaps. So um, one of our first, like, quote-unquote specialty malts was a Munich-style malt. Um, so researching the, the the process for that, as much information as we can get on that, again, and a lot of that is proprietary in terms of how they really, what the true parameters of all of that were. But we understood that there was a stewing process in the kiln. Um, wherein, while the moisture content was still high in the green malt, they brought those temperatures up to the sugar conversion temperatures so that they would start to create those those reactions um, to develop flavor and some early color development um, and mouthfeel and, and aroma, aromatics and things like that. So understanding that that was something that we could do, then it led to um, okay, so let's play around with this at some different points. You know, let's play around with this at like. Let's dry it down to X percentage and then raise, raise the temperature. You know, more moisture allows more conversion, less moisture allows some conversion. So we developed our, our serenade malt, which is kind of like our uh, English pale malt, but we use some of those stewing techniques um, in the kiln to create something really has a little bit more depth of, of color and flavor, more presence. It's, it's 
we've kind of um, we're ge- we're aiming towards something in that Golden Promise Maris Otter um, area, which you know a lot of brewers liked when they wanted to take that next step up with their base malts. They'd look at these traditional UK malts, which you know on the surface are about the variety, but when you actually look at the spec, they tend to be kiln just a little bit higher as well. So mm. there's a tiny bit of sugar conversion. Um, so they do; they are sweeter and have more presence when you taste them next to, uh, you know, a generic American two-row base pale. Right. right. Um, so another reason why they're very popular among uh, hazy IPA brewers is base malts these days. Yeah, exactly. So with our serenade malt, we, you know, we didn't do a full stewing, but while it was still in free dry and the moisture content was still high enough to get a good amount of that conversion, we raised the temperatures but maintained the drying process, so we weren't trapping that moisture and creating too much of that conversion, but just enough of it to give it a little bit more presence, a little bit more flavor. Whereas our ballad malt was really our first stab at a Munich style malt. Um, But traditionally the Munich ones tend to be a little bit more biscuity, um, kind of driven around more of that character, dense and biscuity, um, sugar cookie kind of sweet. But we found that when we did that stewing process at a a higher moisture uh, content, we developed these really deep stone fruity flavors. So it still provided the same kind of heavier mouthfeel and a similar color to what you might get from a traditional Munich, but rather than kind of drying it out in the mouthfeel, it gave it a different kind of um, depth of, of fruitiness to it in the, in the conversion. And that's some of this that we have right here. Um, and so just chewing on the kernel, you'll, I mean, you know, it's going to taste like cereal, um, cause that's what it is, but, uh, you should get some of that, just some of that sugar conversion and, and sweetness compared to, you know, this is our Pivich, which is our Czech style kind of pills. So that would be like cleaner, more kind of white grape. Whereas the ballad is a little more lush, um, with a, with a more lingering kind of sweetness that has that stone fruit. So the ballad you could use in the same context as a traditional Munich in terms of filling out the mouthfeel in the body and getting that kind of richer color, but it's also going to push the, the fruited notes of it. So if you're working with a fruitier hop profile, you could use that ballad as a base that really helps accentuate that in a, in a really interesting way. And we did the same thing with like um, a Vienna style, um, I didn't bring that malt, but our blue serenade and blue ballad, um, those were just higher kiln version of the ballad and the serenade. Um, and nobody had blue malts anywhere. So we called them blue because we, <laughs> we kilned them higher. So we got a little bit more conversion, a yeah. little more color on them, but it took that stone fruit flavor into more of that dried fruit kind of category, mm. um, with some toasted almond and these cool nuances, which that, that blue serenade, we've kind of combined both of them together and just produce troubadour blue now, um, but it has this great, it's a great, still great enzymatic uh, potential and, and extract, so you can use it as a base. But because it has the beginning of some of those toasted flavors, you can use it as a base in a darker style beer, whereas now you're starting the building block of that those roastier uh, flavor profiles, those caramelized bittering flavor profiles from the base up, which means that you have more marriage in that flavor throughout. And that was one of the, the big things with just the roasted stuff in general is, you know, with a lot of uh, malt bills, grist bills for darker style beers, you'd see these really complicated grist bills, which a big portion of the malts being used were to cover up the bitterness from the malt that you used to get at that color. And it was like, well, that seems counterintuitive. Like you're getting all this, you're getting a lot of, uh, you know, complexity but it's all muddled together. Whereas if you just use something that was roasted really carefully, um, not just for color, but to develop that flavor in there as well, and it's used fresh, then you get this this incredible nuanced complexity, but from a much simpler malt bill. So it's it's a clearer complexity, if that makes any sense. No, in fact, on the last week's episode with uh, Dylan from Civil Life, we had a, the exact same conversation, uh, strangely enough, and talking about how color contribution and flavor contributions are often offset and, yeah. uh, um, you know, happen in different kinds of ways. And, uh, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about that roasting process, uh, you know, and how you go about that for darker specialty malts in order to maintain some of that flavor without, uh, you know, going overboard on bitterness. Yeah. So, 
Um, that, that was kind of my entry level into all of this world and looking into it was that, that roasting category. And that was one of the other value adds, you know, that I would include in terms of transparency and terroir and the craftsmanship and whatnot is that freshness really does have a tremendous potential. In base malts, you can make the argument that it's not as impactful in certain ways. Like everybody who brews with our base malts will tell you otherwise that it makes you don't it. Don't mind if I finish this bottle? No, no, go ahead. You. This is fantastic. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's super gorgeous. soft and yeah. gorgeous. And what yeah. the carbonation does to those beers is really exciting to me. I'm really loving those. For those that can't see, I've just finished the bottle of Shibble Shabble here as we've been talking. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I distracted you. We're talking no, no, no. about roasted uh, roasted malts. So with the with the base malts, you know, you're still going to get that sugar. And, um, and you're not using it for the impact of color anyway. Um, so in that regard, maybe freshness doesn't have that direct impact, though I will say that if you use a fresher base malt, you can get a lot more nuance of flavor. But when you say no, freshness, what do you define as freshness? Well, that's definitely a question that we're still asking. But number, like right now, most malt providers will tell you that with their base malts, you can, you, you can expect the same um, – the same performance from it, you know, two, two years after production. And, you know, I can tell you right now that yes, some of the performance in terms of extract and color right. might be consistent, but the flavor definitely does change over hmm. time, you know, and that might not be sick more than six months or less than six months or not. That's still something that we're trying to face. But, but without question, when you put something in a roaster or you caramelize anything, you've engaged right. in those reactions You've broken down its cellular structure and you've expedited its degradation process and its oxidation process by a thousandfold, you know, so that with something with a lot of color on it, with a lot of caramelization on it, caramelization is a bittering reaction. It's already going to be bitter, but the way that it's acrid and almost like fatty rancid, you know, in that kind of a carbony, like charcoal kind of flavor is really a definitely a component of not just the way that you approach that roast, but that time in the, hmm. you know, the how, how soon you yeah. use it. And we've seen, you know, a dramatic fall off in how much flavor is there within a month after roasting it. And you have to, I mean, if you've taken something to 400 level bond, like that's a dark, dark roast, then you've engaged in a high level of caramelization within that and so it's definitely going to get bitter really, really fast. And that might be what you're looking for, and that might be what's expected right now. But I can tell you right now that same malt, fresh out of the roaster, um, a day out of the roaster, you're going to get so much more just soft nuance out of with, with tons of fudge and even violet. You know, we've done some spontaneous beers with Zach with the roasted stuff that just pulls out this floral flavor in it that's mind-blowing, you know, that that's actually there. So... Um, Have, has anyone brewed um, same beer using old, you know, six month old versus you know fresh uh, roasted malts? I'm curious about that. Yeah, now I want someone to do it. I know. No, the <laughs> the call is out there for sure. Okay, we thought we would have a lot more time for that kind of R and D. Right, right. You know, a lot more brewing at the malt house, but we're malting at the malt house all the time. <laughs> yeah, we get to sure. do a lot of sensory yeah, take, you yeah. know, like hot steeps and things like that. But full on brew days are rare to come by these days but so that creates though you know another challenge for you in that uh you know when we're talking about barley it's a seasonal thing like you you know the harvest comes in you're making this thing and you know at some point brewers are brewing year round but they brew a little more and sometimes the year than others and right. uh you know this barley is going to be sitting regardless you know before it gets malted before it goes through that kind of process um and then after it's malted you know because you, know, you need to you know create a, a continuity to that kind of supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, getting into the kind of time features of this creates extra levels of complexity. You know, Absolutely, just, just massive levels of complexity in terms of logistics and supply chain management for this kind of thing. Well, and on the raw side, you know, sometimes the grain does need to rest in terms of be, having enough energy to germinate at an even level or to reduce its water sensitivity. So it wants to drink at a regular level as well. So with the raw material, you're, you do have the fortune that, you know, it's in this kind of stasis 
that you're bringing it back out of, you know, you're bringing right, it out right. of its sleep. You're waking it up to start engaging in these reactions, which then open it's up. It's supposed to sit there f- over the winter season right. and, until the next, uh, you know, kind of growing season when it'll reactivate. Yeah. But once you've processed it, it's not in a, it's not, it doesn't then go back into a frozen state. It's yeah. definitely changing, even though you've dried it down to, you know, under 5% moisture content so there's less water activity in general but at the same time like you know that was one of the big things in coffee that hey we did all this work at origin now we understood all these quality impacts through the processing plant we controlled everything and everything was great in the way it was processed then we put it in a jute bag and it sat in a box in the port in san pedro sula honduras for three months and then it arrived in the U.S. and it was a completely different coffee. Go figure. It's like, you know, storage on these raw materials right, is, right. I mean, that, and that's the bigger lesson being just like, this isn't a static thing. You know, it's an organic material that you've engaged in some reaction with and that it's going to change. And so, you know, could some of that change be positive? Sure. In the way it maybe degrades into being a, a more predictive point if you're doing something at a larger scale. But... Can we can we use pot time not necessarily as a negative, but use it in that sense of we know that using it, you know, closer to when it was processed, we might get more out of it. Does that open up doors to to new opportunities? Absolutely. And I think that's an interesting point. N- neither one is right or wrong. Right, they're just different opportunities for each of those kinds of you know, ingredients and in, in each of those different kinds of states. And I'll preach that you know till the cows come home, which is that we're not here to you know, flick the switch and tell everybody they have to switch to craft malt. It's about differentiation. It's just about new opportunities and changing it up and creating new conversation about it and engaging in conversation about it in the first place. That's not to say that somebody producing at a large volume is doing anything wrong, you know, or anything bad. It's just that there's there's room to do something different than what they're doing, which is, you know, what craft is. Right. And, you know, and this is following a a similar arc that, uh, you know, other ingredients like hops have followed where, you know, it was there was a time when hops were hops and you used them for bittering. And, you know, you you use different varieties because they produced more alpha and were more disease resistant. And that was what you used. And then we started paying attention more and more to, you know, flavor out of those things. And that opportunity, uh, you know, as new varieties came online and created, you know, the, the flavors possible through those kinds of right. things, you know, spurred brewers on to be creative because now they had something they didn't have before and they could make beers that tasted a different way now that they had the raw materials to do that. Um, that and, and that becomes this that fascinating dialogue between the agricultural side of beer and, you know, the brewing side of the beer. Um you know, where it's not just, we're not just making the same thing over and over right. again and, and trying to hit some platonic ideal for this thing that existed or even, hundreds or, of yeah, years exactly. ago. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to make the traditional, make it taste like it did 200 years ago or whatnot. You yeah. know, it's. But that agriculture itself, you know, creates new possibilities. Um, brewers explore those possibilities. They feedback, they demand more. It pushes the agriculture in new directions because. Yep. Now that they're aware that some of those possibilities exist, they want to pursue those more. You've got now on the hop side, you know, more focus on hop selection, more focus on hops terroir, uh, more and more breeding going on in order to create new varieties that create more opportunities for brewers. Um, you know, and as a result, of, now you've got even you know different storytelling mechanisms, estate hops, uh, more hops growing around, you know, in various states around the country where similar varieties will taste completely differently. You know, all of these create a depth and a breadth to the you know the the kind of beer experience experience that changes wherever you are absolutely and uh you know makes it not the same thing everywhere and that's what makes it fascinating and engaging to you know consumers who are enjoying this kind of thing right so it's it's about you know finding where those conduits really are or, or laying that conduit in the first place of just tying connecting you know every end of that supply chain so that those conversations are happening that we are driving that and better understanding all those things so we know you know, what that potential is, you know, and again, it's not, you know, a wholesale change of the market, but it it can be something that really, you know, affects everything in a, in a really positive way. Um, And in a, you know, straight economic, economics kind of way, if you're, you know, buying your raw materials from local farms, um, rather than, 
from hundreds and hundreds of miles away, that's completely one that money is going back into, you know, your local economy. Um, but two, now from a sustainability standpoint, now you guys are having a conversation about water rights that is important to both of you. Those brewers need the water and the farmers need the water. If we both need the same water, but we need it for the same reason and the same ends, now we can have a really progressive conversation about that where it's not one side against the other anymore. Now it's like, how do we do this together so that we can make sure it's there for us? We've been talking a while about malt. <laughs> um, before we get out of here, I want to uh, uh, thank our sponsors. GD Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and dedication to their customers' craft. Tavor transports you to craft brewery bar stools all over the country. Country Malt Group understands the importance of excellent ingredients, product knowledge, and expertise. And Clarion Lubricants is the expert that experts trust. Um, so, Chris, what does success look like? for Troubadour Maltings? Well, we're already seeing it right now in terms of expanding. Um, and, uh, you know, farms, you know, benefiting from this, the farms that we're working with and that conversation spreading. Um, success looks like this summer being out at Mark Arnish's farm. Mark Arnish does, uh, does all the genie seed production um, so if you're growing Genie for malting brewing p- purposes, you're getting he's doing the seed production from that. But we also get all of our wheat, um, f- this uh, special uh, variety, Antero wheat, which is a almost a podcast in and of itself. I promise you, <laughs> this wheat is is otherworldly. But he does all of our wheat. He had his uh, field day this summer, and um, his field day is traditionally he's a seed provider, a seed grower. So it's mostly farms other farms there trying to figure out what kind of seed predominantly wheat um, but maybe some barleys they want to grow in the upcoming season Uh, but as we've been working with them with Arnish Farms closely the last couple years we've we've come you know because we're really curious about what else he's working on and he's one of the most you know really progressive intelligent growers in the area in terms of really pushing quality and understanding of what's going on agronomically um and we've brought as many brewers who will come with us uh, to be a part of the part of that opportunity. And this summer, you know, we were standing in a field with, you know, Mark Arnish um, and other growers and ourselves and then uh, Brandon and Lisa from Primitive and then even some friends and some other brewers were there. And we were all standing in a field in front of a new variety of barley. Um, that, you know, we may or may not do anything with, but we were having a conversation about that variety and what it may or may not be able to do. And everybody in that supply chain was standing there watching it, you know, grown out of the ground, having an active conversation about what's, what's next with this. And that's, that's success. Absolutely. Is that we've, we got those people together and we're having that conversation and we're, you know, it's, 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 it's turning into real things. Well, cheers to closing the loop. Cheers to bringing uh, you know the various uh, stakeholders in the world of beer together, from the growers to the malt houses and the ingredients uh, processors uh, to the brewers themselves. Schooly, Absolutely. People want to learn more about Troubadour Malt. Where do they find you? Uh, you can find us on the World Wide Web at TroubadourMaltings.com. It's T R O U B A D O U R to use. Um, that gets left off sometimes. NNS. Uh, really, I'm much more active on Instagram. Um, Troubadour, you know, is a storyteller, and so uh, we like that that uh, medium just because it is, you know, we can we get to tell the story of the people we're working with and the product that we're working with, and just show people that process. So, all right, and I'm here. around too. Just just find me in town. <laughs> Uh, we're going to check out here and go spin some reggae records on, uh, yeah. on the turntables right now. <laughs> Boom, a guy. Yeah, we still uh, we still got to get together for that. Anyway, uh, uh, cheers, uh, Chris. Appreciate you talking Thanks, to Jamie. us about Malt. Uh, we'll be back it. next week with a brand new episode. Uh, that one's going to be uh, Comrade Brewing oh, out sweet. of Denver, Colorado, who just uh, won a few little awards for yeah. their West Coast style IPAs. So until next week, uh, cheers. Cheers. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.